Well, good morning, everyone. My name is DJ and welcome to Church Online. In just a few moments, we'll be moving into a time of worship and then we'll hear a live sermon from one of our teaching pastors. Wherever in the world you're joining us from, we believe that God has something for you in this service. And if you're in San Diego, join us at one of our in-person services. Now, let's go to church together.
Alabaster Jar Project's mission is to fully restore the lives of women who have been sex trafficked. It gives women a chance to rebuild their lives. The people who I'm helping, they're, they're not my clients, they're my peers. Here at the church, we use the phrase, go first, to describe how to live out Jesus' calling in our lives. And 10 years ago, church member Susan Johnson took on this idea in the creation of Alabaster Jar Project. Susan, talk a little bit about how did Alabaster Jar Project get started at CRB? I was doing volunteering at CRB and I was leading a ministry where we were ministering to women in group homes around the county. I developed this deep passion to help those that have been exploited and trafficked. And there was a huge shortage for housing and resources in San Diego County. I went to leadership at the time and said, this is what I feel like God's calling me to do. CRB, from the start, allowed us the space to have meetings, to promote the issue and raise awareness. You're helping to help us raise um, money and hopefully secure property and get that program started. I'm currently sitting in our resource center right now. The location that I'm at is part of our boutique. We offer survivors to come in to help themselves to toiletries, to clothing. This room right here is actually life-changing. So Grace House is a residential treatment program for human trafficking survivors. Typical program houses a lot of women and there's not really an individualized plan. We house up to five women at a time. They get help with everything. We call it being client-centered. We're paying attention to the individual that's coming in and saying, what are your strengths? How are you put together? You know, how did God create you? When somebody has gone through um, exploitation and trafficking, some of that gets hidden for a long time. When they start walking in that truth and in that new identity, not the identity of guilt and of shame that does not belong to them, they start thriving, they start changing and they can actually go out and they can maybe change the world someday. Father, for the ministry that's going to take place, for the women that come in here that have the opportunity to live and recover and be restored, uh, thank you for the, the opportunity we have to do that, but be with each one of them. We are here at the new home that Alabaster Jar Project has purchased to help the recovery and rehabilitation of women who've been trafficked and exploited. This space is going to be totally transformed so we're really excited for us, but we've got a lot of work to do. I hope that the house feels the love in it and that it's in the walls and that the women when they walk in can tell that there are hundreds and hundreds of people who <laughs> love them. CRB has been with us since the onset. Consistently, every year, we have worked towards this mutual goal of benefiting our community and serving our neighbors. We bought this home, and now we'll be able to provide consistent, sustainable services for those women. I think what sets us apart a little bit from other organizations is that we are largely survivor-led. My experience as a survivor of trafficking myself gave me this passion to do something with it. It takes organizations like Alabaster Jar Project to come in with their expertise, with their compassion, with their care, and with their knowledge of what that journey looks like and what it looks like to walk through to the other side. It was individuals within CRB that came together and said, we all have a passion for this. 
that whole going first mentality is, well, show up and figure out what you have in common or what you care about and see what you can do together. That's the story of God's people working together in community to make heaven here on earth. Woo. That not absolutely amazing just to think 10 years ago, 10 years ago, there was a couple of moms in our church who had a dream and they just began to pray, how can God use me? How can God use us? And they began to see the significance of the problem of human trafficking, specifically in our city. And they said, God, every person is made in the image of God. And how do you help people who are far from you or are in situations where their life is broken down? And, and God, over the last 10 years, has used them. God has used our church, and we celebrate that today. Uh, 10 years since Alabaster Jar launched, and we have an opportunity. Here's why we show you that, because we have an opportunity to continue to resource that organization. What in the world is better than that? What vacation are you going to take? What, uh, you know, what are you going to do that's better than that story? And you get an opportunity to fund that. Isn't that incredible? We have an opportunity to play a role in that story as a church. And so we make no apologies this time of year saying, hey, we're trying to raise $1.5 million and we have three big initiatives, uh, one of which is to combat poverty. And there are organizations like Alabaster Jar that we have an opportunity to partner with. And that's what Going First is all about, saying, hey, we want to make a difference. We want to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to those who have lost hope. And we want to be an organization, or we want to help organizations that are specifically devoted towards needs like that in our city. And we invite you to play a part in that. Uh, as we talk about the Collide offering, we're just looking for spaces in our city where we say, hey, God, uh, here's a need. We want to step into it. We want to fill it up with the presence of, of the Lord. And so with $1.5 million, we can do that all across our city. And we can specifically do that in terms of combating poverty and the systemic problems that are attached to that, and specifically with human trafficking in our city. And I want to be a part of that story. Uh, the Collide offerings, how we do that. Uh, we're we're going to uh, be talking about this a lot over the next 30 days. And you can go to crb.gives. That's how you give to that, crb.gives. Uh, we typically have QR codes on the seat, but that broke. So we're calling the, the, the QR company. Um, to get that fixed, uh, hopefully by next week. But crb.gives, we invite you uh, to help us in accomplishing that mission. And that can be incredible in a few uh, weeks when we get to stand up here and say, hey, we raised $1.5 million. Wouldn't that be incredible if we could do that? We're going to do that uh, together. So, uh, hey, it's, uh, it's Advent. If you grew up in church, maybe that is familiar to you. If you didn't grow up in church, I'm going to explain that uh, today. But Advent is this expectation of the arrival of Jesus. And as Christmas comes, part of it is uh, I get to live out my childhood dream of being Aladdin and stand on this rug today, uh, which I love about Christmas. But it's also a time where we turn our heart towards this rhythm of saying Christ has come and Christ will come again. Are you with me? Uh, the power of Christmas is not just that Christ arrived into the world once, but that Christ will come again. And it's this, we look to the past, but we look to the future and say, hey, uh, our God has not abandoned history. Our God is holding all this together. And just like he spoke through the prophets thousands of years ago, he's speaking now and he's arriving in this world. And to people in situations and circumstances where they have lost hope, Today, uh, on the Advent calendar, is about hope. Next week, we're going to look at the theme of peace and joy and love. But what does it mean to have hope in our world now? And what does Christmas have to say about that? That's what we're going to explore together. And I just invite you to posture your heart. I want to pray over you as we begin the Advent season. You can just extend your hands. I uh, just invite you to receive King Jesus in a new, fresh way. Because here's the, the, the trick or the beauty of Advent. It's not just about God arriving one day. It's about God arriving in your life right now. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit showing up right now. Anybody in desperate need of God's arrival in your life right now? Uh, anybody hungry for that? Anybody have an appetite for that. Say, hey, I need the presence of God. I, I need, in, in a circumstance where you're desperate. I was praying with a gentleman before this service, after last service, and he was just going, man, my, my pain factor in life, it's, it's so high, but now my desperation factor for change is higher than that pain factor. That's Advent. 
And I need the power and the presence of the Lord now. So let's open ourselves up to this story and this rhythm of Advent and hope together. Jesus Christ, we thank you. Uh, You came into the world 2,000 years ago. You came for people like me. You came for people like uh, that are in alabaster jar. You came for people uh, like Mary, as we're going to read today. You, you came for those who were on the outside looking in. For somebody today who maybe it's a, a relationship with a daughter that has fallen apart and they're scared to pick up the phone and call. And this Christmas, there's an ache in their bones. I just pray, Spirit of God, would you come? Would you, would you show them in that relationship, in that moment, you still show up? God, for somebody who's... Uh, lost touch with the image of God inside of them. Maybe it's because of self-inflicted wounds. Maybe it's because of what somebody else has done to them, but their heart is just broken down and busted up. And I just pray, Spirit of God, breathe fresh wind that you still show up. That's this story. That's Christmas. God, there's tinsel on the story. Would you just remove that today? There's songs around the story that we sing. There's traditions with it and all that's fine and good. But today, King Jesus, take us to the manger of what it looked like when you arrived into the world and give us a fresh hope, not just for later, but for now. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's children said, amen. Well, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, everybody expected God was going to be in the world. That was not shocking information. How the story happened, that was the shocker. The, the expectation 2,000 years ago is that somebody was going to get promoted to the role of God, that one of the world leaders, somebody on the world stage would get promoted up uh, at this time. And if you're uh, new to church historically, I think this will be interesting to you that this is not just a story you know, in a galaxy far, far away. This is real history. This actually happened. The writers of the story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they record it as history In fact, Luke begins the story by telling you, in the year of Caesar Augustus, in the reign of Caesar Augustus, a real guy, in Caesar Augustus 2,000 years ago, he ruled the world, and he would have been the leading candidate to get promoted to the role of God. That was the expectation, that somebody like Caesar Augustus, he at this time uh, was about 60 years old. This is a picture. This is a real Caesar Augustus. Uh, It's not like a picture of him, but you get it. It's a statue. Uh, This is what he looked like. Uh, Go over there, apparently, is what he's... uh, But Caesar Augustus had ruled the world for 25 years. He had expanded the Roman Empire all the way to places he had never even been or didn't even care about, like Israel. And he ruled the world with peace, or that was the promise. It was called Pax Romana. Some of you have heard of that before. It just meant the the Roman peace that he had brought to the world. Now, it was a weird kind of peace. It was peace he had brought with violence, so it was kind of a strange peace. But nonetheless, the world had known through the reign and the rule of Augustus Caesar its longest stretch of peace. And so the, the hope was maybe at a annual Roman Senate meeting, they would declare once and for all the deity of Caesar Augustus, Cleopatra. You remember Cleopatra from history? She was a real person. There was an expectation. Maybe Cleopatra, uh, who, remember the movie at least, who was it, Elizabeth, I can't remember it, Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, She would be deified. Uh, Mark Antony, maybe he would be deified. Some of the leaders on the world stage 2,000 years ago. Uh, Would it be in a court in Egypt, they would declare one of the pharaohs. The, a deity, that, that was the expectation. Somebody was gonna go up. Nobody expected historically what actually happened, that God came down and that in the form of a baby of all things, in the place of Bethlehem of all places, a baby would arrive in this world through, of all people, a scandalized teenager named Mary, and that God would show up in the backwater province of the Roman Empire, a place that the Caesar had never even been to, that no power, no prestige, no prominence came out of this corner of the earth. And yet there is a declaration from the prophet 700 years earlier. You, you read this at Advent. It was read over us earlier by the Herrera family. We read this last night as a family uh, from the stump of Jesse, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. It's not Christmas till a baby cries, man, just so you know. It's okay. Uh, we're all with you in that. That's what Christmas is all about right there. Uh, which every time at this time of year when we sing that song, Silent Night, I'm like, that person who wrote that had never been in an actual delivery room. That's a very inaccurate song. 
Uh, the reality 2,000 years ago is that somebody would go up, not that somebody would come down, and yet here we are 2,000 years later. We're not talking about Caesar. Caesar is just a salad. Uh, we, that's a pretty good joke right there. <laughs> I could come back to that one. Uh, we, we are talking about the birth of King Jesus, a baby in Bethlehem. I mean, do you, just historically, even if you don't believe Christmas, just historically, the shock, the reality of that, and it all begins with a woman who should not have any hope, who actually has it, and we're going to read her song in a few moments, and her name is Mary. If you have a Bible, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, is where we're going to begin. So you ready to go with Advent? You ready to go? All right. That's why I like you, 1030. Okay, this is Mary. Now, Mary, unless you grew up Catholic, we don't talk about Mary a whole lot. We kind of mention her around Christmas. Uh, we sing about her as some sort of quiet, round yon virgin over there uh, in the corner of the, the manger scene, the nativity scene. Uh, but when you actually pick up the scriptures, Mary's got some swagger, uh, like, like some pregnant swagger to her. Uh, this is the story, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth is uh, the mother of John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus. Uh, if you are familiar with the Christmas story, uh, Zechariah, his father, you remember the whole thing, John the Baptist? Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I always thought John the Baptist, we called him that because I was Baptist. Like, He's one of us. This is great. Um, <laughs> No, he's the guy who does what? He baptizes Jesus. John the baptizer, later he is the one who gets that name. But that's Elizabeth's son. So he's going to be the one who declares to the world that the Messiah from the stump of Jesse has come into the world. God sent an angel, to uh, Gabriel, to Nazareth, which is a tiny little town. You would have, if you lived in Rome, you had never heard of Nazareth. And it says, it's in a, a town in Galilee. You, you had never heard of Galilee either. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. So one of the details Luke really, really wants you to know is that Mary is a virgin. There's a reason for that. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Now this, if you're Jewish reading this for the first time, all this, all the lights are flashing on your dashboard because all the way back, David, King David, a thousand years earlier, he was from the house of Jesse, the stump of Jesse that Isaiah 11, 1 promised the Messiah would come through. So all this would be, oh, is this the arrival? But wait a second, in Bethlehem uh, to a scandalized 15, 16 year old girl named Mary. And it says this to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And then Luke tells you again, almost awkwardly, like we get the point the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, this would not feel like favor. Mary, you know, we read this and we often think, well, Mary must be, you know, clicking her heels and, oh boy, an angel. Uh, no, she's a person with intellect like you. She knows the implications of this, that this is a scandal that she's pregnant. This is not how your story should go. This is not what you dreamed of when you were a little girl growing up in Nazareth. Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary, verse 29, and I'll come back to that, why she was troubled. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. It's not one she would want. She's greatly troubled at his words. Uh, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Well, it doesn't feel like favor. It feels like I'm going to get kicked out of my house. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him, what's the name? Jesus, yeah, Matthew says Emmanuel, God with us, is the, the title of this king, Jesus. Jesus is what you will call him. Uh, now, Luke tells you in painful detail and repetition, uh, the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary. And, and maybe for you, especially this time of year, there's plenty of people who say, you know what, I sing the songs, I play the Mariah Carey records, you know, I buy the Christmas 
you know, drink at Starbucks, wrap the presents, decorate the tree. But, I mean, come on, a, a God in a bod in the world, a virgin birth. I mean, all this is the stuff of Disney. I mean, this is hocus pocus. This is not, you know, and I, I certainly understand that from an iPhone, Google world perspective, a post-scientific world, that that would be uh, something people reject. But if you read the scriptures, the opening line of the Bible is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you sign up for that, now all kinds of strange stuff is going to happen in your life, okay? Uh, a virgin birth, yes, of course. Uh, in fact, all of life is miracle. Uh, you breathing today is miracle. Uh, you having a conversation, forming a thought. You welcome a child into this world, perhaps, at some point. It's all miracle. Uh, you just have to decide where do you draw the line on what is acceptable miracle and what's not. Virgin birth is not that crazy. Uh, the, the reality of virgin birth happens, and we affirm this, because if God is going to come in the world through the seed of Adam, that is a contaminated bloodline. He comes into the world through a pure, uh, pure Mary as a way to say, this is a new story that's launching. It is a new humanity that is being created. Uh, that is not a throwaway detail of the story. We affirm this detail of the story. Uh, th this, is, this is what actually happened. Luke wants you to know. And by the way, if you're going to make up a story, this is not the story you would make up about God coming into the world, uh, especially in terms of how all this would go down. Uh, it, it's a significant problem for Mary that she is pregnant. 14, 15-year-old girl, a peasant girl in the corner of the Roman Empire in Nazareth. Nazareth was a town of about 250 people two, uh, 2,000 years ago. So if you got pregnant out of wedlock, yeah, people are going to talk. Uh, this, is not, this is not good news for you. A marriage ceremony 2,000 years ago, it would be a seven-day-long feast and festival. Seven days. Friends, family would come in from out of town. And it's not like weddings in our day where where it ends, there's a dance, and then the bride and groom get bird seed thrown at them and get in a limo. Uh, there was, that was not ancient tradition. They didn't, you know, peg bird seed at a donkey as you wrote all. It, it, what you would do in an ancient society, when the marriage ceremony was completed, the seven days, the bride would go and live with her family for a year and would not cohabitate with the groom, if you know what I mean. Uh, they were not allowed to live together. She would live with her family and learn what a good first century wife is supposed to do. The groom, Joseph in this case, he, after the wedding, would go live with his family and would build, spend the year building an additional uh, unit or room onto the house that his parents lived in. And Mary and Joseph would, at the end of that year, after Joseph had paid to the father of the bride what was called a bride's price, uh, which would be a varying amount depending on the wealth of the family, then Mary would move into Joseph's house so if you're pregnant, everybody would say, wait a second, uh, I, don't think, I don't think Joseph's built that room yet. Uh, th like, yeah, this would, be, this would be a scandal. Imagine how angry uh, Joseph's mom would be at Mary, you know, that she's cooked up this story. I mean, so if you've ever fought with your mother-in-law at Christmas time, that's actually quite biblical. Uh, <laughs> of course, like this whole thing, of course Mary's troubled. What does this mean? Now, the story takes a hairpin turn in Luke, uh, where all of a sudden, uh, Joseph, uh, he gets on board with the program. You read the details there. Uh, Mary begins to turn, and she begins to see the expectation of what all this means. Now, what, what this means for you, if you've ever been in a position where you are in the middle of a scandal in your life, where you have done something that you regret, you have never been closer to the original Christmas story. If you're in a circumstance in your life right now where you're going, man, I need hope. I need God to do something here. I don't quite know what to do. This feels like it's bigger than me. Uh, if you're in the middle of some problem at work, if you're in the middle of a situation with your family where you're going, I don't know if we're going to speak again. This is, uh, we feel estranged. It feels like all hope is lost. You are smack dab in the middle of the original Christmas spirit. 
If you said to your spouse this year, I don't know if it's gonna feel like Christmas this year because this person, this situation, whatever, I, I don't even wanna put up the tree. I'm just nervous about whatever it may be. If you have had those emotions, those thoughts, those feelings, the Christmas, the original Christmas story, it, it's exactly where you are right now. The Christmas story begins with those who had a boot on their neck and didn't know if they were gonna be able to breathe. That's where the whole thing kicks off. And so Mary begins to see, maybe there is favor, maybe there is promise, and she begins to remember the words of the prophet Isaiah that had been spoken, that this was actually good news. And she launches what's called Mary's Magnificat. And it's the longest uh, speech by a woman in the scriptures. It's this long, eloquent, poetic song. It doesn't translate the same to us, but it's powerful. And I want you to read this because we read it and we, we miss the, the meaning of it. We kind of spray tinsel it, but it's, it's, there's a power to this. And Mary said, verse 46, once it sort of clicks, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And then it takes this odd political turn. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Who in the world would she be talking about? He has brought down rulers from their thrones. What in the, what kind of Christmas song is this? Taking down rulers from their thrones. Like, no, we sing heaven and nature sing, not off with the head of the king. You know, this is odd. This is a very strange Christmas carol she's putting up here. But has lifted up the humble. So he's bringing down rulers and lifting up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. What does this say? He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. That which seems to be forgotten by the world and those in power, God has remembered. Abraham and his descendants forever. So this isn't just Isaiah 9, 11. This is Genesis 12. This is all the way back to the people of God being formed to the promise of Abraham. You're blessed to be a blessing just as he promised our ancestors. Uh, this passage of scripture, it's politically charged. In fact, throughout history, there have been governments that have, been, that have banned Mary's Magnificat from being read in public. Most recently in Guatemala in a revolution, uh, you could be thrown in jail for just reading this in the public square because it was just, it was humming with revolution as you read it. Now, as you read it, who in the world is Mary talking about? Why is she so agitated. I mean, why is she rulers from their throne? I mean, it's like, come on, Mary, get with the Christmas spirit. Uh, well, keep in mind, Mary, she's in Nazareth when this happens. She's going to, in her third trimester, by the way, have to make a 70-mile pilgrimage from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And she's, she's going to have to do this because a Caesar that she had never, like, never even seen a picture of thousands of miles away, has lifted his finger and declared a census in the world. And so her and Joseph are going to have to travel 70 miles across Judean wilderness. It's not a fun walk, especially in your third trimester. And she's going to have to go there because Caesar wants a census. Why would you collect a census in the ancient world? What was the reason? What did you want as Caesar? You wanted taxes, exactly. Some of you are like, now I'm with you, Mary. Uh, yes, she was going to have to go there because this Caesar was going to take his hand and put it in her pocket to take more money, which she did not have. Her whole village was impoverished, and here she's going to have to go declare to, uh, to the government that the Caesar can get more of her money. It wasn't just that. Caesar, if you were Caesar, the question is 2,000 years ago, if you're on your throne in Rome... How do you rule a state or a nation or a province that you have never even been to, like Israel, that is thousands of miles away? You would appoint what was called a puppet king or a client king, 
And this is another key player in the Christmas story. In this case, there is a king that the Caesar has appointed. And what is his name? Yes, King Herod. I always feel weird his name rhymes with mine, but it's true. King Herod. And King Herod, real guy. These are real people, real place, real time. Uh, This is a picture of King Herod, uh, or at least what they believed he looked like. He has an uncle named Santa Claus. We'll read those verses later. Uh, See, the whole thing's connected. Uh, The belief, uh, historians will tell you this, Herod uh, historically is viewed as the wealthiest individual who has ever lived. The amount of prominence and prestige and money and power that this man had, oh my goodness. And everything he did, how did he pay for it? Yeah, not much has changed, has it? Yes, Uh, taxes. And so he's taxing the Israelites 80 to 90%. You cannot afford to feed your family. Meanwhile, Herod is building another palace for himself. And he would do all this to spite the Israelites and to flex to the Caesars and the other leaders on the world stage of his power and of his prominence. In Bethlehem, to this very day, uh, if you're in Bethlehem, uh, real place, real people, there is a mountain, sort of like when you're in Seattle, and everywhere you go, you see Mount Rainier, In Bethlehem, everywhere you look out, there is a mountain called Herodian, still there to this very day. This is a picture of uh, Mount Herodian. Uh, Okay, between you and I, I just snapped that in Ramona yesterday, but it's... uh, (laughs) uh, All biblical images, you say it looks like Ramona. Uh, This is uh, the Herodian. Now, this did not exist. There was no mountain And Herod said, oh, we should put a mountain there like you do. And he did. Uh, He constructs a mountain. And so there was no mountain. Herod literally moved a mountain, which, by the way, years later, Jesus is going to come along and say, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can do what? Yes, you can move a mountain. Would everybody have some familiarity with someone who moved a mountain? Yes, of course. Everywhere you would look in the distance, this mountain of Herod And you would hear that, you would say, only Herod can move mountain. And Jesus is declaring, no, with a faith the size of a mustard seed, you have the power to take the reign and the rule of the evil of this world under the authority of Jesus will go down. If you just have the faith of the mustard seed, the, the, the Herods of your life can go down. You can move mountains with this, the, the same power, the same authority that Herod, you, you, under the authority and the kingship of Jesus. Uh, and so this image is everywhere. This reminder of Herod's glory. Uh, there is a city, it's still there to this very day, called Caesarea Philippi. It was uh, 60 or so miles from Jerusalem. There was no city. Herod builds a city. The largest port in that world, uh, in the world 2,000 years ago, was in Rome. It was around uh, 50 to 60 acres. Herod constructs a port that is 520 acres in Caesarea Philippi. Everything extravagance. And again, how is he doing it? He's using your resources and your money. Uh, Might you have a little anger against this guy? Yeah, of course. Um, He financed the Olympic Games that were in Greece. Uh, he, he would pay for that. How, where is he getting the money to do this would be the question if you are a peasant from Nazareth. And so as Mary declares, uh, kings, what does she say? Yeah, this guy's going down. Uh, there is a revolution in my womb. Uh, this, this reign, this rule. Uh, where in your life right now Does somebody, something, feel like it has its boot on your neck and you can't breathe? You have never been closer to the original story of Christmas than when you have declared that whatever, whoever that is, is not going to have the last word over your life. You have never been closer to the original Christmas spirit than when you have risen up with hope and declared in your life that Jesus Christ will have the last word. That although in this moment in your story, it feels like there's no sign of God's faithfulness, but you have said and you have prayed, God, I am going to remain faithful because I believe throughout all of history, the Herods, the Caesars do not get the last word, but you, King Jesus, get the last word. That is the original Christmas spirit. 
And this time of year where we, you know, drink the drinks and we sing the songs and we wrap the presents and we, you know, read the stories and we read the books and we get so caught up, may we go back to the original Christmas spirit in our life. For some of us today, you are in desperate need of hope. You know there are people in our city in desperate need of hope. Some of us, this Christmas will be the first Christmas where somebody who was there last year is not there this year. And it could be through death or circumstance, but there is a pain and there is an ache and it feels like life circumstance has lined up against you and there is this pain inside of you where you don't even want to celebrate Christmas. You have never been closer to the need of Christmas, the arrival of King Jesus in this world than you are right now. That's the power of Christmas. And would you join with Mary in declaring the hope that our God has not forgotten her and our God has not forgotten you. That's the power of Christmas. When you are on the margins, when you feel like for whatever reason, you are on the outside looking in. Some of us this Christmas, uh, it's a relationship with a child. It might be a, a child that lives with you. It might be a child that moved away and conflict and pain and reconciliation feels like a million miles away. And you're not sure how to bridge that gap. And it feels like a boot on your neck. It feels like she did something. You've done something. I don't know if we can, we can bridge this divide again. You have never been in more need of the song of Mary, the hope of Christmas, than you are right now when those painful moments seem to dominate your head and your heart. That's Christmas. That's the place where Christmas begins. Some of it's because of jobs. Some of it's because of uh, resources that aren't there this year. You know, I, we feel a, a lack. We feel a loss. That is the place, not from the top, but from the bottom, not from the Roman Senate, but from Bethlehem, that God declares revolution is going to begin and that he has not lost sight of his people. That's Christmas. That's the hope. That's the power. This Christmas, in our city, when we talk about alabaster jar, we have an opportunity to go to those who have lost hope, to those who feel like a boot is on their neck and they will never recover. And we have an opportunity not just to give money, we have an opportunity to declare that Jesus Christ will have the last word over their life. And we have an opportunity to show up in the hopeless situations of our city. We have an opportunity to show up in the darkness and say, hey, we want to bring light all across this city you know this is true from middle school students to high school students, the next generation, depression, suicide. There are those who have lost hope. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are more needed than ever to stand up in a city and declare Christmas. Our God has not lost sight of you, and we haven't either. And we're going to show up again and again and again. And the church has never been more needed. The power of Christmas has never been more needed in our world than it is right now. And maybe you look out at the news and you go, man, there is no reason for hope. We go back to the original announcement and not just the good advice, but the good news that Mary declared that there is reason to hope because Jesus Christ has arrived in the world and is still arriving in the world and will not be done arriving in the world to those who have lost hope. And we show up in those moments again and again and again. What does it look like for you this Christmas? to bring hope to those who have lost it? What does it look like for you this Christmas to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to our city? Uh, we want to be that kind of church. We invite you to play that kind of a role. This Christmas, maybe for you, you go, man, I just need hope. Would this Christmas be the Christmas you remind yourself that it's all about hope and a God who has not lost sight of you? As you look out, maybe this Christmas, you go, you know, we have everything we need. We, God has blessed us so much. Would you go be the blessing to somebody else who has lost hope? That's Christmas. Not when you get the thing you want. Not when you give to somebody else who already has everything they need, something that they want. But when you show up to somebody who has lost hope and you bring it, that's Christmas. That's the revolution of Mary. That's the power of this baby Jesus, King Jesus, showing up in the world. We bring hope. We invite God into spaces. We say, God, use us to be the answer to the prayers of those outside these walls. We want to be that kind of church inside these walls who says, yes, we, we, want, to, we want to be that kind of church. We want to be that kind of a place. Let's pray together. God, there's those within the sound of my voice, some mountains in front of them. 
It's a relational mountain. It's some ache in their body and in their bones they don't know what to do with. They don't even want to talk about it anymore because words fail and the more they talk about it, the worse it seems to get. This Christmas, would you move the mountain, King Jesus? God, somebody's in the shadow of some Herodian and everywhere they go in their life, they just see it. It's like a darkness hanging over them. And they feel like there's no reason it will ever move. This Christmas, will you move the mountain? God, you promised through the prophets you would not forget your people. And you declared through the voice of a 14, 15-year-old girl that you had not forgotten your people. And here we are as the people of God in 2023, looking out at our world often with an ache in our bones and in our body going, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem right. And would you remind us today, King Jesus, you have not forgotten your people. We need that individually. We need that corporately. That reminder, God, would you write it on our hearts today through song? Would you write it in our hearts today through prayer that you are a God who keeps his promises? You never fail. That's who you are. Or someone doesn't see a sign of your faithfulness today, God, would this Christmas be the Christmas where the heavens open up and they see a breakthrough, they see a collision in their life in relationships and finances where heaven's crashed into earth and they say, my goodness, I didn't think we could go on, but now we know our God is with us. Would we see that in our lives now, God? We, we wait, we expect, we hope. Would we not lose hope? God, somebody within the sound of my voice is hanging on by a thread. They don't know if they can push through. They don't know if they can forge through. God, I pray, would, the, would King Jesus arrive in their story now? Would hope begin, would hope arise in their spirit now? That whatever mountain they're in the shadow of can move. God, we just pray, we ache. We long for that. Make us the answer to our prayers for our city. A city that's lost hope. Would it rise up in us and through us? And it's by the power of of the Holy Spirit, we pray these things. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's children said, amen, grace and peace.
Thanks for joining us today. We believe that following Jesus was meant to be done in community. If you need to connect with a pastor to receive prayer or have any questions about our church, please call the number below. If you feel like God is calling you to step up and become more passionate about how you live out your faith, then visit gofirst.church to get to know our values and to connect with one of our staff to get involved. We'll see you next time.